Hi everyone. Um, thanks for, for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Richard Eisenberg. I'm principal researcher at Twig IO, um, and I'm, I'm happy today to be talking to you about my work on Stitch, the Sound Type Index Type Checker, uh, which is a functional pearl and um, and something of a of a tutorial paper. So we'll see exactly what what I mean by that as as we go through. But the the goal of this is really to to provide an accessible way of learning about some of of the advanced type system features in Haskell. Um, so you'll see here on the slide that uh, the, the we're going to be looking at some source code today. You can follow uh, along at home with that if you if you just follow that link um, to richard.e.dev slash pubs.html. That has all my publications. You can find a tarball there. It's also linked from the main ICFP program website. Um, okay, so let's let's dive in. Um, so so there's a lot going on in Haskell, right? So Haskell started, um, you know, the, the, the first version of Haskell 1.0 was 1990. Um, and, and since then, there's been lots and lots of work. This is just a small slice of, of, of work that has been, um, has been put into, into Haskell and developing out its type system. And uh, one of the beautiful things here is, right, that we have all of these published papers is something I love about about working in Haskell is that we get um, we get we get peer reviewed publications as we come up with new ideas uh, for our language and uh, but with all of this change with all this stuff having been that, that that's been developed um, where does that uh, where does that bring us how do we how do we use it all um, and so uh, this sti this work on Stitch is an attempt to answer that question. Um, so Stitch is a simply typed lambda calculus. Um, here's a small interaction with it. It is a full REPL. It is a standalone application. Um, uh, I have used it to help teach undergrads about the simply typed lambda calculus. Um, although, of course, we're not going to be focusing on that aspect of this today. Um, uh, instead, we're going to really be focusing on the implementation. So the implementation is not quite undergrad level. It's using a little bit more whiz bang stuff. Um, but the, the thing to the, the the point I'm trying to get across on this slide, right, is that it is a fully fledged application. We can launch it. We can interact with it, and um, it has a parser and it has a type checker, and then it has this this evaluator um, for this this simply type lambda calculus. The key idea behind it is that in the implementation is that we add extra details into our types to make sure that our implementation is correct. And so we'll see exactly what that means as, as we go forward. Um, OK, so now we're going to walk through the different phases of, of this STLC interpreter. So the first one is lexing, right? We're given a string. The user types something, and we have to figure out what are its tokens. Well, even in, in something as fancy as the Stitch implementation, this one's boring. So we're just going to skip. Uh, next step is parsing, and you might think that's also boring, but you'd be wrong. Um, so let's let's look at this. So we want to parse uh, from the output of the lexer, right? This is our, our parse exp function, and it's going to take the output of the lexer, which is going to be a list of located tokens, so they're located so we can report errors, um, into uexp. U here stands for unchecked, so we get a list of located tokens to an unchecked expression. Well, that's close, except we don't want to just uh, you know, crash if if there's something if there's a parse error. So that's no good. Uh, so now we're going to have the same input, but the output is going to be uh, either an error message or a result. So that's that's closer to it. Except actually, when we're parsing, we're not going to just parse any expression. We only really want to parse closed expressions. Uh, so if I just write x. And we're going to say that that doesn't parse. Now, one could argue, oh, well, that does parse, but then it doesn't do name resolution or something. But I've actually collapsed name resolution and parsing all into the same pass uh, because of the um, uh, everything in this language works left to right, so we can we can really pull that off. Um, so what I want to say instead is that the output is either an error message or it's an unchecked expression with zero free variables. So this index on ux is the number of variables in scope. And so here, when I'm parsing an expression from the user, we're going to expect there to be zero variables in scope, because they're going to be writing a closed expression. Um, so how is that really going to work? Well, the result of parsing is what I'm calling a, um, a length indexed abstract syntax tree, where I, what I'm, using, I'm saying length to mean the number of variables that are in scope. So I define unary naturals, that's the top of the slide here, 
Um, and uh, I could use GHCs, built-in naturals. Uh, those turn out not to work as well in practice because they don't have the right inductive structure. So we're just going to define our own here. And then my UX type is going to be indexed by N of kind nat. Um, and so here, uh, it, this N is the number of variables in scope. Um, it's also worth pointing out that I'm using a sort of an, an, a different coloring scheme uh, to syntax highlight my code, which is more of a semantic coloring scheme than the, than the syntactic one that many editors use. So constructors, for example, are this sort of darkish orange color. Uh, types are this green color. Local variables are purple. There's a couple of others that we'll see. I'm not going to explain them all, but it's, it's very much a semantic oriented one, not a syntactic one. Um, so that's the number of variables in scope. And um, when I have a variable occurrence, then I'm going to use a de Brown index to note what that variable is. So this is an alternative to using a name. I'm not going to say X or Y here. Instead, a de Brown index uh, counts the number of lambdas that occur between the binding site of a variable and its occurrence. Um, and so because it's just doing this counting, there's no difference between lambda x dot x and lambda y dot y. It's a simpler, more, more canonical uh, way of representing variables. Um, and we're going to get back to what fin means in just a moment. So just hold off on questions about fin. Um, here, uh, we, we have a lambda abstraction. So we're going to need the type of the argument. Again, we don't need a name for the argument because we're just using these to brown indices. And then we have the function body. The interesting thing about the function body is, of course, one more variable is in scope. So this is indexed by suck of n, not just n. There's one more variable. Uh, applications are straightforward. We have an application of a function to an argument. They both have the same number of variables. In a let expression, we have the let bound value, but then there's the body. This is the part after the in, and that also has one more variable in scope. So we see the suck appear there. Um, OK, so I said we we're going to look at fin a little bit more. So what is fin? Fin stands for finite set. And the type fin n contains exactly n values. So if we have fin 0, well, that has 0 values. Well, if we have an expression, a closed expression, then there's no variables, free variables, that could occur in that. So that's what we want. If we have an expression with two variables in scope, then there's two possible fin values. And so we can assign these to the natural numbers. That's how I can call them a de Brown index. Um, so some of you might be thinking, oh, what about undefined? Let's just ignore laziness. In practice, we can, we can pull this off with strictness annotations and such. Uh, but we're not going to get into that detail right now. I'm also going to overlook exactly how fin is implemented. Um, uh, if, we, if you want to, in the Q&A session after this talk, I'm very happy to, uh, to talk about that and, um, uh, and show you exactly what, what fin looks like. Uh, but we don't have time in the main talk. OK, so going back to this, now we know that this fin n has exactly n values. So all of this together means that all variables, all expressions really, must be well scoped in this, uh, in this uh, data type. OK, so if that's the output of parsing, let's, let's return back to parsing now. And it, we can look at our parsex. So now we know that we're parsing something that we know is going to be well typed, well uh, scoped. Um, after we're done parsing. Not well typed, that comes soon. Um, so let's look at the implementation of parsex. So I want to implement this using uh, uh, monadic parser combinators. And so we're going to have some expression combinator in here. And what's that going to be? Well, it's going to be some parser. We'll define what parser means on the next slide. Uh, but here, it's going to output a UX0. Except that can't quite be right, because we can't write that recursively. Of course, in the middle of parsing a closed expression, there's going to be some expressions that have sub-expressions that have free variables. Um, so here, uh, we're going to look at this expert. So now we want it to be quantified over n, for any n. But that's not quite right either, because it means that the parser is going to output this n, but somehow it's not part of the input. So how are we going to know whether x is in scope or not in scope? That doesn't really work out. There's no, there'd be no way of implementing that expert. So instead, we're going to need to index the parser monad itself to say how many variables are in scope. That's the only way this is going to work out. Um, OK, so if we, if we look at this, um, well, now we have to define what is this parser. So a parser NA is going to be a parser for an A, that's its output, right, with n variables in scope. 
Uh, we're going to build on top of the Parsec uh, library here. So Parsec T is a monad, is the Parsec monad transformer. Uh, so we describe its input. Its input is going to be the list of located tokens. That's what we saw earlier. Turns out we don't need any state for this, so the state is, is trivial. The underlying monad is a reader of this vec string n, which represents the variable environment. Uh, so this is going to be x and y and z. These are all these variables that are that are in scope. Vec, um, many of you maybe maybe have seen before in similar presentations, uh, is a length indexed vector. A vec a n stores exactly n a's. So a vec string n will store exactly n strings. So maybe x and y are in scope. So we know we're storing exactly x and y and not any other strings. And the order in this vector that will give us the de Brown index that we're going to need when we parse a variable. Uh, and then, of course, there's this A here, which is the, the result of the parser. Um, OK, so, so just taking a step back, to support having well-scoped expressions, I want my unchecked expressions to be well-scoped. But in order to support that, we need to index the parser monad and use a length-indexed vector. So I wanted something. I just wanted this well-scoped stuff. But in order to do that, I needed to add more types elsewhere. Types are social creatures. Right? When we start using some types in some place, we're going to need to add more types in other places to support it. So one worry at this point, thinking about how types are social creatures, is that maybe we end up defining some library that has so many types that it becomes impossible to use. It turns out, although it's not a focus of this talk, that is not, um, it's not something that we need to worry about in that it is possible to define simpler interfaces uh, over some fancy typed um, uh, implementations. So, but for now, we're not really going to be looking at that, so we'll just stick with types or social creatures. Okay, so we've done, par we've done uh, parsing and name resolution all tied together. Now, let's do some type checking. Uh, so to understand this first, we need to know what types we're dealing with. Our simply typed lambda calculus supports ints and booleans and functions. Um, and the output, instead of just being length indexed, just keeping track of the number of variables in scope, it is type indexed. Uh, so first, I define what typing contexts are. Uh, well, a context of size n is going to be a vector of n types, that, that data type tie that we saw on the previous slide. And my expression type is going to, going to work for any context size um, and any sort of result type. So what do I mean by this? Well, an X CTX tie is an expression of type tie in a context CTX. So those of you familiar with uh, traditional typing judgments, this is really what we mean, that if E is an expression CTX tie, then the, the typing context CTX has all the information to check E at type tie. That's really what we're trying to achieve here. Um, OK, so now we're going to look at the different constructors of this, um, of this AST type. So the var constructor is going to use a de Brown index, just like we were using for unchecked expressions. Of course, this de Brown index has to be quite special, because not only is it giving us a number, but it has to relate the context to the individual type. So really what it's saying is, is that in the context, that's this list of types, this is going to be the element in that context. That's why, that's why we use the word elem here. So the elem is defined by this type down at the bottom of the slide. And we can see it has this Z constructor and an S constructor, so it really is an encoding of a natural number. But the types are much more interesting. The first constructor, EZ, we can call it here, means that X is an element of the list X cons X's. The S constructor, successor, is there. It says if X is an element of X's, then X is also an element of Y cons X's for some Y. Um, but when viewed operationally, this is really just a unary natural number, and so it works very well as an encoding of a de Brown index. And it also allows us to relate this type tie to the context CTX. So after variables, we have lambdas. So now lambda takes previously the unchecked lambda, it just took the type, but now uh, we actually use s tie, which is a singleton, um, because this arg information, we need it both at compile time 
right? Because the argument type both has to be a uh, cons onto the context for the body of the lambda, lambda, and it also produces part of the type of the overall lambda expression. The type of the lambda expression is arg arrow res. So that's that's it needed at compile time, but it's also needed at runtime in order to print out expressions. We didn't see an example of that, but this interpreter is is capable of printing expressions involving lambdas. Um, so because we needed it both, we need what's called a singleton type. So a singleton type looks just like a normal type, except that the constructors of the singleton type, like sint and sbool, relate to constructors of the sort of the regular type tie t int and t bool. Um, so here we have s int s bool and this double colon arrow to relate to t int t bool and the single colon arrow. Um, I'm not going to get too much into detail about singletons here, other than it allows us to have information that's both available at compile time, in other words, we have these variables arg and such, and at runtime we can do pattern matches on it. Um, so there's other other presentations, um, uh, you know, and other works that, that describe singletons in, in more detail. Okay, so there's there's um, there's lambda. We also have applications. So applications, we see that the two sub-expressions are in the same context as we would expect. But the first sub-expression has type arg arrow res, and then the second one has type arg, and then the result is a res. Right? This is traditional function application. Um, so then we have to think about now if that's the the um, uh, syntax tree that we want to get as a result. How are we going to do type checking? Um, so let me just take a, a step back, actually. With that, that uh, type index abstract syntax tree, it means that once we've type checked, we know that all expressions are well typed. Any further transformations, like evaluation, or as we'll see, common sub-expression elimination, have to respect the types. If they don't, then the stitch implementation will not compile. That's sort of the, the one of the key things in this implementation. It's one of the reasons we're using fancy types. So let's look at type checking for a bit. Um, so when we look at type checking, uh, we're going to have some check function that looks like this, that takes a UX um, that has n variables in scope, and in some monad that can handle error messages, so we're just going to call it m. In reality, it's a little bit more complex. We're going to produce an x in some context and some type. But this is no good because there's no sort of relation between the different parts of this. Uh, so what we really want to say is that th the input to this checking function is going to include a context. Now the context has to have the same length as the n that's used in, in, uh, in UX because there's the same number of variables in scope before and after type checking. And then the result is going to have some type. We're going to learn that type as we're doing the type checking. Um, so that's why I have exists here. Um, but unfortunately, exists doesn't in Haskell yet. That's actually something I'm, I'm working on at the moment. Maybe some fun news soon in that space. Um, so instead of using exists, we're going to use this trick and use what's called continuation passing style. And so here, uh, instead of just returning this type, I'm going to pass that type as a for all type to some other function which finishes the processing, producing an MR, and then overall I'm going to produce an MR. Um, and so uh, here, this for all, because it works for any type, this, is, this really behaves quite like it exists. Um, so that's quite close. Though now the one problem with this type signature is that we don't have enough data at runtime to be able to make our decisions. Instead, we need this SCTX. So this really is the final type that we're going to have. Um, let's look at it just for another moment here. So this SCTX, that's a singleton over contexts, right? Because I need it at compile time so that I can mention it in XCTX tie. And I need it at runtime because I'm going to need to know the types of my in-scope variables in order to complete type checking. So again, it's, it's this, when we ever we need something both at runtime and at compile time, um, we're going to have to use a singleton. That's what connects those two phases. Uh, OK, so uh, it's easier at this point to just jump over to the code. So let's, let's do that. Um, so here we have the most interesting part of, of the check. There's actually some, it's a helper function named go, um, but it has that type that we were looking at previously. So go here takes the typing context. So this is actually this singleton context that says what the types of all the in-scope variables are. 
we have an, in, an incoming expression. So we're looking at the application case because that's sort of the hardest and most interesting. That's the heart of a type checker, right? Um, the hardest and most interesting case because we want to make sure that the function argument has the same type as what the function is expecting. And then this k is not a kind. It is a continuation. Um, and, and that's sort of what does that further processing. So how are we going to write this? Well, um, first we're going to check e1 and e2. Checking e1 produces fun tie. That's going to be the type of e1, as well as a type checked version of e1, which we're calling e1 prime. We have e2, which is the arg tie, which type checks to the arg tie, and then e2 prime, its type checked version. And and now, having done that, now we have to check, well, is fun tie actually a function? Right? It would be really bad if I tried to say, um, apply the number four to an argument. That would be no good. So I have to check that it's indeed a function. So we do a case and see, is it really a function? And then we have to check to make sure that the expected argument type, which is this arg tie prime, matches the actual argument type, arg tie, right here. And then we do this using this test equality operation. I don't want to get into the details of, of this right now, um, other than to show that uh, because of these extra checks, because of this type indexed uh, AST that I'm using, so right now this compiles, but say I forget to do this expected versus actual check. Then if I try to reload, I get errors. And we can scroll up a little bit down here. And where is it? Could not deduce that the argument type arg matches t1. That's sort of this inferred type uh, that, that GHC is naming. So I've forgotten a check in my type checker. And now I know that because I can't compile my interpreter anymore. That's the, that's the wonderful thing that I've gained by having this type indexed AST. OK, so let's put that back in place. OK, so that's just one part of it. There's plenty more to look at. Um, you can definitely do that um, outside of this, of this talk. So let's go back to the slides here. OK, so now that we've type checked something, we have our type indexed AST. Um, the next step is evaluation. If it type checks, it works. Uh, this is one of these transformations on something that's already been type checked. And so, yes, we do have to do some care about capture avoiding substitution. But if we make any mistake, the interpreter itself does not compile. And so it means that if, we, if the interpreter compiles, we're pretty sure that it's going to work. Um, I suppose you could try to be very clever and introduce just the right mistake that respects types, but somehow doesn't respect some other operation. But that would be rather hard to do in practice, or to do by mistake, I should say. Um, OK, so we're not going to look more in depth at evaluation. Common sub-expression elimination. Um, so just to show that this approach scales to some realistic transformations that one might want in a compiler, uh, the stitch interpreter includes uh, fe this feature of common sub-expression elimination. But we have the same wonderful result that to get this to work, we just sort of have to follow type errors. It worked out, uh, um, you know, there's some thought about doing the right sort of mapping and uh, um, uh, and to, to get all this to work out. But every mistake I made, I was told right away. Um, so one step of this is I needed a new um, mapping type, a new version of hash map. So I took the type from the unordered containers library and just generalized it to work with these indexed types um, because my map might contain things of many different types, but I wanted to have just one map. Um, and so I, I generalized that. This was a beautiful thing. It was about 2,000 lines of code, and it took me only about an hour just following type errors. OK, so recap. What did I do here? I identified a data invariant that I wanted. In other words, that expressions were well typed. I checked that invariant by adding more types on, this X, on my exp type. Then I had to prove that my code respects the invariant. So in the parser case and in the in this well scoped AST, that you, that required more types, and then repeat. And doing all of that, we get um, we learn that it is good to be fancy because we can type check. Uh, we can we can be, have greater assurance in the correctness of our code. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>